Hello everyone. Would you like to become an expert in the rapidly expanding field of geographic information science and remote sensing? And in the meantime, gain knowledge on topics such as food security, water management, and climate change? Then the online MSc offered by both ITC faculty at the University of Twente and Loon University might be the right one for you. My name is Michael Marshall, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Natural Resources in the ITC faculty of the University of Twente. I am also the teacher of today's mini lecture. In order to introduce you a bit to this online MSc, I will start by highlighting the flexibility it offers. For instance, if you recognize yourself in a work family lifestyle and you need flexibility in content, in study location, and in study tempo, this might be the right choice for you. By following this online MSc, you can also get a double degree if you follow 25% of the program on campus where you can experience the international environment of ITC. In the end, you will be awarded a degree from Lund University and a degree from the University of Twente ITC. Today, in this mini lecture, we will jump into the topic of remote sensing for food security analysis. Other courses covered in this online master's are electives from website, hydrology, computer, programming, ecology, five through six example, internet GIS. GIS can stand for Geographic Information Science or Geographic Information System. GI science raises questions concerning the acquisition, processing, representation, and analysis of geospatial data. Geographic information systems are tools that allow GI scientists to manipulate geospatial data. Remote sensing is an important category of geospatial data. A remote sensor can be defined as any instrument that collects information without touching it. The human eye, for example, is a remote sensor because it receives light energy from a source without touching it. The digital camera is a more modern remote sensor. A digital camera records light reflected from a surface and stores it as an image. Digital images consist of pixels or grid cells. Light intensity at various frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum are represented in each pixel by a digital number. Similarly, sensors on board satellites, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, or airplanes record light reflected or emitted from a source across the electromagnetic spectrum. They record current surface conditions and relay that information back to Earth. We call this type of remote sensing Earth observation. Let's take a brief look at how Earth observation is used for food security analysis. Food security analysis determines whether individuals, households, communities, or other populations are hungry and food insecure. It also assesses the underlying causes, which are important for decision makers to design appropriate interventions. Food security can be evaluated by four metrics. They are availability, access, utilization, and stability. Availability deals with the supply side of food production. It not only concerns the amount of food produced, but whether food can be brought to market and exchanged for some form of currency. Droughts, floods, land degradation, and poor infrastructure can greatly reduce availability. Access, utilization, and stability represent the demand side of food production. Access refers to the purchasing power of a population. There can be an adequate food supply, but if the population is economically poor, they can't afford to buy it. Price spikes due to local or global food shortages can prevent access to the world's poor, while richer populations remain unaffected. Utilization deals with nutrition. It not only concerns which kinds of foods are consumed, but how food is processed and prepared, fried, Processed meals consisting mostly of carbohydrates, for example, would be considered poor utilization. The last factor, stability, measures the tendency and persistence of food insecurity over time. Chronic or permanent food insecurity is the most extreme form of instability. It is usually triggered by periods of infrequent food insecurity 
that slide a population further down into the poverty trap. For food security analysis, Earth observation is almost exclusively used to estimate food availability, specifically the amount produced. More recent studies have combined these data with socioeconomic data to capture market access. Food production is defined as the harvested crop area multiplied by the harvested crop yield. It is typically measured in kilograms or metric tons. Crop area is measured in square meters or hectares. It is simply defined as the area over which a crop is harvested. In practice, however, it is difficult to determine because what defines a quote crop varies. Is crop area only the cultivated area or does it also include infrastructure in uncultivated areas? Should it be defined by the area planted or harvested? How should it be measured in mixed cropping systems or systems with more than one growing season, as is common in the tropics? Several remote sensing techniques have been developed to estimate crop area. We will discuss these in a separate lecture. For now, I would like to focus on crop yield estimation. Crop yield is the ratio of the mass of grain, seed, or other agricultural production to a standard area. Like production and crop area, mass is measured in kilograms or metric tons, while area is measured either in square meters or hectares. It is often confused with crop biomass, which is the total amount of above ground material collected at harvest. Yield is the marketable fraction, typically around 50% of crop biomass. The Green Revolution consisted of a number of critical agricultural achievements that increased crop yield and helped meet demand from a rapidly growing global population. Of course, this narrative has many critiques, and I would encourage you to study them in your free time. This chart tracks wheat yield in metric tons per hectare from 1850 to 2014 for several countries in Europe. As you can see, the Green Revolution began in the 1930s but it didn't really take off until the late 1960s. What made this rapid increase in production possible? The expansion of arable land under cultivation and irrigation were perhaps the most important achievements. Breeding crop hybrids that produced higher yields under adverse conditions and the increased application of fertilizers, herbicides for weed control, and pesticides were also important factors. Crop yield models try to capture the factors of food production in order to better understand agricultural systems and to aid growers, farm managers, and other decision makers in optimizing food production. Whether empirical, semi-empirical, or process-based models are employed, spectral information collected by the remote sensor is used to develop a vegetation index. Perhaps the most famous is the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI. NDVI exploits the spectral properties of plants in the red and near-infrared, or NIR, wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. These diagrams represent the spectral information recorded by a remote sensor above a cotton field in California for two periods of time. Peaks represent regions of strong reflectance, while troughs represent regions of strong absorption. In each diagram, focus on three regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. The green portion, around 550 nanometers. The red portion, around 670 nanometers. And the NIR shoulder, which begins around 780 nanometers. The first spectrum was recorded in June and represents the period when the cotton field is dominated by soil spectra because the cotton is just sprouting. As can be seen, light across the spectrum is being mostly reflected. In August, when the field is photosynthesizing and fully productive, there is an obvious peak in the green and NIR and trough in the red. The reflectance in the NIR is due primarily to the structure of cotton. NIR is not visible to the human eye, so we don't actually see it. It can, however, be detected by remote sensors. Crops absorb strongly in the red portion of the spectrum. Chlorophyll in plants, which convert sunlight to food, preferentially absorb red light. If the cotton 
reflects more light in the NIR and absorbs more light in the red, NDVI increases. This animation for Ethiopia demonstrates an empirical crop modeling approach. We see NDVI derived from remote sensing over a year. It is sensitive to the greenness or biomass of crops. When NDVI is high, as can be seen in the agriculturally productive western and southern parts of the country from the beginning of May, biomass and productivity increase due to the onset of the main mare growing season. Images in this case are from Dr. Case B at ITC. Semi-empirical models, also known as light use or production efficiency models, consist of cost functions that regulate the amount of biomass generated by a crop during photosynthesis. The functions typically relate to quantum efficiency or the ability of crops to convert CO2 into biomass. Temperature, vapor pressure deficit or relative humidity, and the amount of energy available from the sun, or photosynthetically active radiation, also known as PAR. Photosynthesis is the process by which crops convert sunlight into food and then biomass. Remote sensing data are used in production efficiency models to derive the fraction of PAR, or the leaf area index, LAI. FPAR and LAI essentially measure the fraction of sunlight that is used by the crop to make biomass. The diagram on the right uses Landsat imagery to predict yield in this way at 30 meter resolution. Areas in bright yellow are more productive than areas that are a duller yellow or brown. The white striping is emblematic of Landsat 7 ETM+. Process-based models use a number of empirical and theoretically based relationships to estimate crop yield. In addition to the light use mechanisms governing production efficiency models, process-based models include parameters concerning soil quality and crop management practices. This makes them more complex, but also more accurate if sufficient data is available to tune them. Many of the conditions are tunable by the user. Remote sensing in this case is used primarily to either tune or evaluate the model. The model is tuned, for example, until the error between the model and remote sensing based FPAR or LAI is small. Now let's take a look at how remote sensing is being used to better understand agricultural systems and inform decision makers. The Monitoring Agricultural Resources, or MARS program, was established in 1988 to improve agricultural policy in Europe with Earth observation. Since that time, it has expanded its services and disseminates information to places across the globe. One of the important services combines weather data, remote sensing, crop statistics, and agronomic models to forecast seasonal crop yield. These forecasts are included in monthly bulletins or can be downloaded online as maps in near real time. Growers can use computers, tablets, or mobiles to interrogate the maps and target interventions that prevent crop yield declines or failure. In this brief lecture, we defined what geographic information systems and remote sensing are, and how remote sensing is an important source of GIS data. We also defined food security in terms of its four major components. Within this context, we were able to explore how remote sensing can be used to estimate crop yield, production, and food availability, which is one of the components. Finally, we demonstrated how remote sensing can be applied to real-world issues in food security analysis. Thank you for watching this mini-lecture. We hope you got an idea of what our optional courses look like. If you wish to get more information on this online MSC, please visit our renewed website.